This is too exciting. Hi, makers. How is everyone doing today? Everyone learn a bunch in their sessions? OK, fantastic. Um, I'm so excited about this moment. Um, I will take a moment of personal privilege, and Allison knew I was going to do that. Um, but this is such a full circle moment. Um, because 24 years ago, um, I started a job working with Miss Allison, um, sitting right there, and working for Miss Judy McGrath. And so it is just an honor and a privilege to share the stage with you. So with that, okay. So this is what we actually love about Bakers. These moments of coming together learning from amazing trailblazing women and here okay, how lucky am i, I, I mean, <laughs> we just had dinner around the holidays I I was like chatting with a friend i mean that we're gonna keep it chatty it we're is. just we're it's just like you know we'll just pretend carol's here and we're you know we'll just keep it keep it going um and my guest today is someone who we can absolutely learn from you will love her as much as we all do please welcome legendary media executive oh Amazon Board of Director, former CEO of MTV Networks, Judy McGrath. All right, thank you all. <laughs> Hold your applause so you see if we deliver, right? Um, so we're just going to jump right in. Let's go. Um, so I love that this is called the third act, but I said, but Judy, is this your third act? What act are you in? And like, give us a little... Like, give us a little background on the other acts. Well, you know, I, I was thinking about this, um, about the title of this, and I thought, you know, I think a third act is really kind of a misnomer, much as I love the makers and Allison, because if you think about it, especially today, if you're a woman in your 30s, 40s, 20s, you have had three or four acts by the time you hit 40, right? And I mean, it. I never thought that a career was a linear path, like a theater play, like you, you set your sights and it's act one, act two, act three. It's really much more like um, a loop. And, you know, I, I try not to label it, you know, which, which act am I in or which act is anybody in? And I'm trying to think of like what's relevant when you're at the beginning of this or you're much further along like I am. and. Um, I think in my own life, I would say, my own career, the first act for me was the building act. And, you know, I left a perfectly respectable role and a job at Condé Nast for a completely disrespectable, insanely, no playbook, no rules, no nothing role at the beginning of MTV and Nickelodeon and Comedy Central and then the great BET networks came in and, and um, so that was a time of a lot of yeses, not a lot of noes, a lot of, you know, on the fly, make it happen. And then by the time the next act rolled around, it was like success. And success comes with different skills you have to develop. There are more noes, not as many wild and free yeses, let's try this, let's try that. And you need to learn, you know, sort of operational excellence, you need to become a better manager, you need to um, think about the organization differently than maybe you did before. And at one point, I think when I was around that time, Jerry Laybourne, who was the founder of Nickelodeon, um, said to me, you know, you will never be as successful as you can be if you don't start to look at business with the same sort of passion and interest as you do the creative side, because I was always on the creative side, and I was like, it's, but I thought about it. And you know, the thing about the industry we were in, it was early days, cable, I hate to say it, I think was filled with women because it paid less than broadcast and a lot of other things. And there were, there were a lot of women around, and we were kind of inventing it and making it sort of resonate for ourselves. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna learn business. And I did. I really thought, you know, I'm gonna try to figure out how to be a better business manager. And I do remember I went to a budget meeting and I said something like, you know, EBITDA, OIBDA, obladi, oblada. And nobody <laughs> laughed but me. 
Um, so, I mean, I couldn't completely leave who I was and try to pretend, you know, I was that other person. But um, anyway, like, it was a good point that I hadn't thought about, really, you know, until I talked to her. And then you roll into this phase. And I think the key things are, you know, any opportunity, I think, to learn something new and to feel like what you've learned along the way is going to be appreciated by somebody else is a great way to spend your time. So, you know, I had some advisory roles at um, Group 9 Media, which was now this news and the dodo and thrill list. I learned a lot from them and I was able to sort of think about all the hard knocks and lessons I learned along the way that helped them a little bit too as they moved into another company. And, you know, I did a, I, I wound up doing, I'm talking too much on the first question, so here's the whole thing. But anyway, I did a, a startup, but I did it sort of like 50-50. I partnered with a company I knew and respected and that was kind of stable, Sony Music Entertainment. And then on the other side, I put a small band of people together because the influencer culture was exploding. I was always interested in what young adults were doing. And so we had this little company, and if you remember, there's a period of time when the mobile companies were all getting into short form video craziness, you know, Verizon Go 90 and all this stuff. So we made, um, there were two things that we accomplished that I was really proud of and had a great time doing. And that was one of the young women on my small team saw um, someone on YouTube, and we called her and brought her in, and it was Nora Lum, AK Aquafina. And she was just starting out and doing her thing. And we said, what would you like to do? How can we help you? Maybe we can get you some distribution, some money, whatever. So she wanted to do a talk show, T-A-W-K. She had a little tiny desk and she put it on the subway and she put it in a grocery store and she put it in a laundromat and she talked to her grandmother and her friends. Her friends were like Lizzo and Pete Davidson. And anyway, it was wonderful. And from that, she springboarded into a series at MTV which she didn't really love, and then she made her way. You know, I mean, I would never say we did that, but we didn't. But we saw her and recognized her and, and said, let us help you. And, you. and we did the same thing for Lily Singh, who's another extraordinary talent, who built her own way, but wanted to do a tour movie. So I thought, okay, what I'm good at is trying to help and support and find talent like this and try to help them like move along on their next step, which I think when you get to be where I am, you have sort of a moral imperative to do. However, it wasn't successful. I wasn't that great at it. I was you, great at that part, but not all of it. You were, well, yeah, I'll, I'll save my last comment for myself. But so I just want to take it back a little bit because I love your point, I, um, the Condé Nast piece, and then obviously moving to MTV Networks. And then how long were you at MTV Networks? A long time. A long time. Uh, <laughs> 20 years, 20, 20 something 20 years. And it was always changing. Though. Always changing. Mm -hmm. And it was so many different things and the Viacom and the blah, 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 all the things. Um, but I'd love to just dig into kind of the pivot um, leaving that. And just for, for context and background, it's like you, there's a special place about MTV Networks at the time when Judy was at its helm. And there was a feeling, there was love, there was compassion and empathy. And you know, I think one of the things that you always taught all of us was how do you use your superpowers for good? And that's mm -hmm. always been like a theme of my life of how do you use superpowers for good because that's what you have. And I'm curious, as you thought of kind of moving from all of this accomplishment and all these things that you how did you use your superpowers for your own good in kind of pivoting out of one building, 1515 is a moniker for us, um, into kind of the next iteration or pivot? Well, you know, one thing Jeanine and I were talking about, I thought that, you know, when I was um, in the company I essentially grew up in, it was like a bubble and I rarely ventured out of it. I never really went to anything like this. I didn't meet other people. I didn't really, um, when I did meet them, I was thinking, wow, that's like an interesting person, in another company, like how come I don't really? And I mean, I think that I would encourage people, especially if you're thinking about a pivot, like try to meet people along the way who do different things than you do. And there are ways to do that, you know, and I'm, you know, make a connection. It isn't really networking. It's just sort of like I was had blinders on, I think, to the rest of the world. 
which isn't great. It gets too insular, no matter how wonderful it seemed. So, um, and you know, pivoting is exciting and bumpy, and it's hard to find your value in it because you think you've got a certain set of skills that work someplace else or worked for you, and then you really have to say, okay, what else is there that I might be good at where I could bring my superpowers for good if I have any and, um, and still learn something, you know, so that I'm not kind of stuck where I was. Right, right. And uh, I mean, I just think you have to, um, in my opinion, a career was never a straight line, it, but today it's really a crooked path. I mean, I feel like the sands are shifting all the time there's so many things going on you have to be cognizant of and like try to look at them as opportunities. And um, you know, you just have to walk out where, of wherever you're gonna walk out of to try something new and have faith that you can do it and get there. And you know, keep your head up and. Well, you said something earlier that I had never really thought of in all of these years is the fact that in the cable industry, there were so many women in the cable industry because it was lower paying than broadcast. That like just hit me like a ton of bricks. I don't know if anyone has thought about that before. I just had not. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a time where you had so much um, women leadership we did. in studios, in television. We were talking about a couple of Vanity Fair cover, a, a Forbes cover, a couple that um, we were able to work on. And... You look at it now and it does not feel the same, but also, you know, so my question for you, is it reflective of the kind of environment we're in? We're in? Is it, did we set ourselves back? Like, how do we unpack that? I mean, I don't think we set ourselves back. Um, it is a challenging time. I mean, I look at, because of my experience with Amazon now, and as a board member, you're not a obviously not an operator, which was something I had to learn, but you, um, and I look at, so Jennifer Salke comes in and she brings Vernon Sanders with her and she works with Albert Chang and she hires um, Courtney Valenti to run MGM and Sue Kroll to run marketing and she's doing the things that you should do, I think when you're a female leader, which is give people who are not, who don't identify as straight white male a shot because they don't need help, right? <laughs> um, and I feel like somehow this time that we're in, I don't think it's gonna last forever. When everything contracted and became like massive, how, how often do you read like Paramount isn't big enough mm -hmm. or everything isn't mm -hmm. big enough? It starts to feel like there, there are fewer chairs mm -hmm. at the table, you know, the musical chairs, and they seem to go to familiar faces who get more chances than we do, but um, I think you can't lose faith that that isn't gonna be the way always. You know, there are gonna be trailblazing new opportunities, there are gonna be companies that'll wake up and recognize their customer base looks a lot more like this room than maybe the people who are leading the company. Um, but it is disappointing. I mean, I do have to say, you know, I even asked, Sherry Redstone that question once, like what happened to all the female leadership? Mm. You know, in this company, your movie studio was run by a woman, you know, your cable. What'd she divisions. say? She said, well, you know, I looked hard and I couldn't, I was like, no, 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 no. let's not even, <laughs> I, I take it back, we you don't know. want to know the answer. <laughs> um, she was aware, and I mean, yeah. I said, look at you, man, you're out there, like you're one of us trying to lead this thing, and um, you need more people. To do that. You need more people to do that who are, I'm with you in more ways than one. No, I, that's a good point. I'm curious, um, we had a conversation earlier about, um, uh, for those of you who are in the how to ask for a promotion conversation, um, around taking risks and kind of really being out there and just what you have to do to kind of get to that next level to be in a position. Because I think the other part is, you know, what we don't talk about is you have to be in the strongest position to do whatever kind of pivot that is. So I'm curious, can you take us back to maybe a risk that you took um, that positioned you well kind of moving forward? Well, you know, I think the companies that you and I grew up in were really all risk, you know, in so many ways. You take risks on talent, you take risks on yourself, you hire people who probably aren't really ready for whatever it is that they need to be doing and you help them get there. Um, and, you know, you were saying to me that there's this notion that you have to be essential to the business um, or you're in danger. And I mean, I think that's a, 
a hard thing, and I don't believe that should be the defining thing. You're gonna miss out on a lot of amazing talent and people if you look at it that way. So I mean, I think I was, I grew into a role where I thought I was basically trying to understand the agenda of the senior management and protect and defend everybody else. You know, I felt like I was, it was wearying. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think my pivot was from enjoying being a creative person into really trying to value being a, a manager who could have a vision and take care of people and lead and grow. And I mean, I didn't really get any good training on that. It wasn't valued in the company. You didn't get a big star or promotion or anything exactly for that. But I thought, I have to learn how to do this and stop just fooling around with the South Park guys. You know what I mean? Because it's not there's so much fun. move the thing down the road the way it needs to go. Um, so, I mean, I think you have to recognize your strengths, wonder about what it is you want to do, and then just figure out how to, like, damn do it. And how, obviously, you were such a mentor and hero, or learn new language I've been here, hero for so many people. Like, who were your heroes, and who were your people that you looked to to kind of help you navigate it? Because then, as we're sitting here, I just, I don't know who that would have been. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, in, in the infancy of this industry that, you know, is very challenged right now, but is, there were a lot of, you know, there were lots of women around to look at. There was a woman running the Cartoon Network. There was Oprah doing all the things that she does. I mean, I had to look outside mm -hmm. and kind of try and figure out what other people were doing and feel like, remind myself that as the, the rooms changed and they were maybe more dominated by people who didn't look or think like I do or you do, I just had to keep hope alive <laughs> and, you know, and bring people with me. Yeah. I really tried to bring people along yeah. with me, you know, and I really think that's what you have to do. No, you, you totally did that. And I think just developing that curious mindset. So that's interesting mm -hmm. how you, you mentioned that. Were there other things that you did to kind of cultivate that? I mean, obviously your relationship with talent and just kind of being in the culture. And I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about you know, how did that even, and we didn't even get just a quick little like where you grew up and just kind of, because you just kind of pop into MTV and know everything that's hot and cool. Like, how does that happen? <laughs> Definitely not. But I could recognize the people who did know what mm -hmm. was hot and cool. So I kind of learned that, I think, along the way. You know, at one point, I think one of the things we did, whether it was intentional or not, um, Hillary Clinton came to our offices when she was running and she was standing next to me and John Sykes and a couple other people, and all these people are coming in to meet her. And she turns to me and says, I can't believe how many women are here doing non-women jobs. You know, I mean, it was like pretty much everybody. I can remember a Video Music Awards where all of the production, all of the leaders, the stage, everything were all female. Not the guys pushing the stuff around, but it was all, and I thought, somehow we got here, and this is really good. And even she noticed it. She was like, I'm astonished at who I'm meeting here. And lots of people came to see her, whether they were voting for her or not. And um, I mean, I think you just have to be very intentional. I mean, I, this is like, uh, I'm trying not to ramble too much here, but I was thinking about this. How did I get there? Um, I happened to see a great um, panel once. It was a, some kind of an awards thing for women. It was in New York City. And it was, um, the first award was, Oprah was giving Gail King recognition for O Magazine. And there were all these extraordinary women all the way down. The last person was Tina Fey, who brought Seth Meyers. She was the only one who didn't, um, you know, anyway, bring his sister with her. So at one point, some woman who was getting this award said, I feel so, I'm so lucky. I am so lucky. I get to do what I love. I've been very lucky in my career and I'm really, and then a few women down, it was a reporter, female reporter, and she teed off on this idea of luck. Hmm. And she said, women always think they're lucky. Men never say, I'm so lucky I got to do. And I mean, I'm not in this to yeah. talk about it. It's just the, kind of yeah. the way it is. And so by the time it got down to Tina, she said something interesting that I didn't expect. And she said, I'm not sure that I agree that luck isn't in this. I think luck is in it. But I also think it's timing. 
And she said, by the time I got to Saturday Night Live, I came in with Maya Rudolph and Rachel Dratch and Amy Poehler, and Lauren was ready. He was ready, and we just said, okay, here are all these sketches they killed. They're funny, they're good. We're gonna write some more, and we're doing them. And he said, okay. And she said, so I think timing in life is something like to keep an eye on as you're mm -hmm. trying to build your own. And I kind of agree with that too. I mean, I leapt into MTV early when everyone was like, are you kidding? They thought I was like, it was like the worst decision I could ever make to walk out of that building and join this crazy thing that looked like for an audience that no one cares about. It's a terrible idea. You will, and actually an editor said to me, if you stayed here for 25 years, you could be managing editor. And I was thinking, I never even really was thinking about being managing editor, but, but now thanks. you put it that way, goodbye. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I mean, I do think the timing was right. I hit the timing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had always had a, like a great passion for music and I was willing to take risks. And it was at a phase in my life where I could just say, you know, what the hell? I don't, I can jump into this if it doesn't work. Then there you go. Will have been, I'll have learned something, it'll be fun. And it worked. Well, that notion of timing is really interesting, particularly as we're thinking about whatever act we're in or wherever act we're going. Um, what are some of the things that, as you made kind of the shift into kind of board work and some of the other things, um, what was interesting about that timing? Well, you know, the, the board work, um, you know, I had done some board work and then I got the call from Amazon. And the, the great good fortune of that call is that it's a very small board for such an extensive, you know, entity. How small is um, small? Ten. And the board is 50% female. Wow. Um, and of the, the, there were two women there when I joined and two who joined subsequent to me, um, others left were um, Edith Cooper, who was at Goldman Sachs, a partner, and then ran their diversity and inclusion and had started a business with her daughter and is like incredibly impressive woman, and Indra Nui who had done the great, yep. you know, PepsiCo worldwide and talk about someone who had been a warrior mm -hmm. of, you know, epic proportions trying to run that business. Um, so I sit with really sharp, intelligent people from other, you know, the one of the other board members is the head of computing at MIT. You know, I would never meet him in a million <laughs> years, you know, not even, it would never happen. And interestingly, we were talking about something and he said, I agree with Judy on the topic of talent. Your technical people are talent, and you have to recognize that. You have to listen to them and think that their idea is important and not just look at them as like, you know, widgets coming in to download whatever it is they know. You know, there are some themes here that cross what she knows and what I believe. So it's, in a, and it's a small group, so you get to do that kind of thing. So it's, Fascinating, not to mention they were, it took me back to the beginning of my career because they were in building phase for a media business. And so they needed to learn some of the things I knew about how to operate in a creative, talent-driven universe that isn't exactly like the one they are experts at in building the rest of their company. So it was exciting. Well, that's, I would love to get to dig into that a little bit more. And I think one of the things that I, I heard was just around the preparation. And I think as, again, just going to this point of, you know, I know there was a board conversation. I wasn't in that workshop this morning. But what do you think, you know, the, the nine people were in the Amazon, they're like, we need one more person on this board. Um, what do you think they were saying about you? And do, I know you just answer it because this is the most humble woman. She will not... <laughs> Um, but what do you think they were looking for and how do you think you prepared yourself for that moment? Because I think so many of us, we want these opportunities, we see them, but it's about how do we prepare ourselves to be in that room? Well, it was a rigorous interviewing process. I had to meet everybody individually and um, we all came from very different places. You know, there are lots of, I was the only person on the board who had experience. I am the only person now that like I've had. And the last person I met was Jeff Bezos over a breakfast. And I came out of that breakfast as I think we've probably all had this feeling thinking this is the worst meeting I've ever had in my life. <laughs> um, 
I didn't really know his style at the time, but I have like, I'm, I'm respectful, I'm appreciative, I am humble, but I can't really completely lie and bullshit my way through a <laughs> direct question. And at the time they were in the middle of something that was sticky. And I, he said, what do you think, what, would, what do you think we should do? And I said, I think you should settle this, make it go away, you look like Goliath. And you know, and he said, I completely disagree. But what do you really think? So this went on throughout the whole breakfast. Everything I said, he challenged. And I finally said, look, <laughs> you know, you're, you're Jeff Bezos and I'm not, but here's the thing. You know, I mean, I think it depends on if you want to, how you want to come, come off to the world and what you're using your superpowers for. And if you care about that, then I think some of the things I said are valid. And, uh, you know, I, because at that point I was thinking, like, I can't really just say yes, sir, mm -hmm. anymore in my life, and, but respectfully. Okay. So I, um, I left, and then they <laughs> called and said, do you want to join the board? It was like, oh, my God. <laughs> that is such a respectfully, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> that'll be my, my takeaway. But I think that's a, such a good, this notion, and there was a, the conversation for those who were in the negotiating salary um, conversation earlier about like if you're not essential to the business, if you're, you know, and, and how you have to work harder. But what happens when you actually don't believe in what the company is doing and you don't feel like it's a safe place to say, to say that? Well, I think a, a number of things can happen. I mean, I think for me and to some extent for you without speaking for you, I mean, I was not aligned with management. The macroeconomics had changed. They had a vision of things that I couldn't really wrap my head around. And um, so, I mean, the right thing to do was separate um, at that point. And I was, you know, I don't think their obligation to me was to reshape the business around what I thought. But at the same time, my obligation to myself was not to line up around something that I couldn't see as, you know, a vision that I could really lead around. So um, that was a, like a real step away moment and reassess. Well, I'm taking away from that and um, we should all write this down. Like, what is the obligation to ourself? I just love that statement. Um, and, and with that, I know I don't have a lot more time. I'd love for you to give some advice to the makers in the room about creating that obligation for themselves. And as they look to pivot, act change, <laughs> whatever it is, kind of create that path for themselves, what advice would you give to the women in the room for that? Well, you know, I asked my daughter, who's 28, what I should say, and she said, you should say, be yourself. And um, I, I actually think if you really have to twist yourself into too many pretzels to get to where you think you're supposed to be going, you're not in the right place. And um, I think work is such a part of our lives and who we are, you all deserve to be doing something where you're appreciated, um, where you're challenged, where you're, um, you know, you're not conforming to something that really doesn't feel right to you. And it's, sometimes you can make change within a company. I've seen it happen time and again, depending on who's leading. Um, I personally think the generations coming up behind us are infinitely better equipped for a million reasons to write the future because the next generation always is and the nature of work has changed, how we work, how we sort of, um, sort of join together around work when you're not all in the same place all at the same time. But that's all like the crooked path that's an opportunity. And so I think you really have to have faith in yourself, not blind faith, but faith. You're here, you made it, you really did. And you know you deserve a spot where you are aligned with management if you're not management, and they are willing to give you opportunities and willing to you know grow your value. Or else, I I did look around to try to find people I aligned with, men, women, you know, um, and there were some in our company who were, and you know I can remember having one ferocious battle with my boss, who I was very aligned with, 
at the time around getting into political coverage. Mm. Rock the vote, choose mm -hmm. or lose. And he was like, I understood what he was saying. We are an entertainment brand. We don't have permission to do this. It's a terrible idea. Nobody cares. This is awful. This is boring. It's not going to work. <laughs> and so I went back to my desk and I cold called a reporter at Newsweek. I probably should have called you and said, look me up with somebody. And I said, will you come over and make us smart so we can ask some questions of these candidates? Because I do think, I always thought music was like social commentary and, you know, along with all the things that are hip and cool, it's not just hip and cool. It's like, what else matters to you? And, and the idea in my mind was, you need to listen to these people, not they need to show up and vote for you. You're not addressing them their way and their venues. So come on in. But I, so I went back to him and I said, look, okay, we spent six weeks with this guy. He taught the reporters what to do. We're smarter than we were. I'm not going to embarrass you. And he said, fine. Okay, do it. So I did the work. I did some work. And it was um, the most, one of the most impactful campaigns and, and probably what and people there was know luck. MTV most, most well, for. Well, there was luck there too. Yeah. It was the 92 yeah. election. You but know? timing, going back to the timing part. Yep. And timing factored into it. We read the tea leaves and the zeitgeist the correctly. Well, reading tea leaves, reading the zeitgeist, not being tied up as a pretzel, that is like I will, will never have a pretzel and eat, enjoy it in the same way. Um, Judy McGrath, thank you. Judy, you thank need you. to be thank talking. You. I love thank you. you. Thank love you. Thank you. Thank so you honored. Friend. Allison, thank, thank you for having us. Allison, the great Allison. Williamson. The great Allison, Meedy Williamson. Thank you all.